I'm sitting here with a man who needs no introduction, but since I'm a huge fan of run-on sentences, this is Charlie Papazian. Ta-da. Charlie, <laughs> thanks so much for talking to us. I've always wondered what it was like in the early days before homebrewing. How did you get started in a hobby that was illegal at the time that you wrote the complete joy? How did you get started? How did Depends you get how, started? How, how did I personally get started? Or yes. did how did you get started in homebrewing? Oh, uh, well, it was when I was going to school at the University of Virginia and uh, somebody in the neighborhood introduced me to his homebrew. And in those days, at least in where I was going to school, there were no homebrew shops. So, but there was uh, malt extract, hop malt extract right. available in supermarkets. So, basically, you know, we were still living in the uh, age of the prohibition-style homebrew myth mm -hmm. that uh, you know, exploding bottles, and still the most of the recipes that were available in those days were left over from prohibition. And it was, uh, you know, hit or miss. Yeah, and uh, I missed the first first time, a couple of times, but uh, figured out a few things and was able to find uh, actually a home wine making supply store that sold some brew brew supplies, um, pretty elementary stuff, but you know actually packages of what they call dried beer yeast. Who knows what it was, uh, but it was better than baker's yeast. Right. And corn sugar was better than cane sugar. Um, and uh, you know, we eventually figured out that barley malt was what makes beer taste good, not sugar. <laughs> so it's a giant leap forward. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Who was your guru? My first batches, my guru was hope and a prayer. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> I had nothing except a little piece of paper for a jot of down from this old timer who gave me a. Re a good recipe, and I had tasted his two-year-old beer that would seem to be pretty good. And I said, oh, I wouldn't mind duplicating this stuff. And then I guess my, my first guru really was probably uh, Fred Eckhart came across his book, Treatise on Lager Beer, uh, which he came out with in the very early 70s. And, uh, you, know, you know, he helped guide me and then uh, came across a few more books from England Kind of had to decipher the language, though. English mm -hmm. English is different than uh, American English. Leaders and, and leader. Well, pints are different. Different. Yeah. And the ingredients the that were available downs. were different. And just kind of had to figure it out on your own. But Fred was the uh, uh, original guy here in this country that had he that was organized to publish. You know, he was publishing a little bulletin about home brewing yep. and. and uh, you know, he had a, a small following of disciples, and I, I guess I was one of them at the time. <laughs> Do you remember what your first batch was, your very first batch? Well, it didn't, didn't have any intentions, but it turned out to be uh, kind of a light amber ale. Um, didn't, in those days, still didn't know what hops looked like. It was, you know, hop-flavored malt extract, right. and just assumed that that was one of the ingredients that was supposed to be in beer at the time. Um, so it was an amber beer, amber beer that uh, doesn't taste anything like any amber ale or lager that I would make these days, but in those days it, it uh, was far better than the, <laughs> what we were drinking and belching in the college students. Better than the alternative anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. Tell me about the AHA and what the inspiration was for you to form it? Well, I say the inspiration was having uh, partaken of too much homebrew at, uh, at a time. <laughs> you know, his friend and mine was uh, myself, Charlie Matson, and myself. Uh, you know, we were buddies, and uh, he had taken my beer making class uh, back in 1973, I think it was. And uh, we're drinking beer one. Uh, a number of evenings or afternoons in the mid 70s and thought of wouldn't it be cool now that we knew you know many hundreds of home brewers in the Boulder Denver Colorado area where we were stationed where we were live where we lived uh, wouldn't it be cool to kind of publish something that had recipes in it and share information and tips and so we drank more homebrew and the idea of 
sharing a newsletter turned into sharing a magazine, and we drank, drank more homebrew, and turned out to be, let's start an organization, and then turn, drank more homebrew, and came up with the word Zymergy. Actually, a friend of mine told me what Zymergy meant, and one thing just led to another, and once we drank more homebrew, we decided, well, this might get pretty serious if we do this, so let's, uh, let's think about it for a year, and then drank more homebrew for a year, and after that period of time, 19, December 1978, the uh, first issue of Zymergy rolled off the printing presses, and uh, we distributed about 2,000 copies to friends and homebrew shops around the country, and were met with either delight or derision. <laughs> Most people thought we were crazy, and who were these guys, crazy guys in Boulder that thought they knew it all? Of course, we didn't know it all. We were just having fun, but uh, definitely the the core support came from the Colorado area where we personally knew people and they knew what our intentions were and to have fun, relax, not have, worry, have a home brew and make better beer. It's a really fertile ground that you sowed those seeds on because it's grown into something much, much bigger than it was when you started. Did you ever imagine that it would turn out like this? Well. Oh, well, again, you know, when we drank too much homebrew, yeah, we managed it. We managed millions. We managed billions of people making homebrew in every corner of the, of the world, but then we get sober again. And, uh, <laughs> reality struck. We better start. figured, well, maybe we ought to start with one homebrewer in every neighborhood, and I think we've gotten there, at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you think we could still get there? Well, you know, there's what? half a million to 700,000 people, I think, uh, the American Home Brewers Association estimates <clears throat> that will have make beer at least once every year. And that's, that's, an impressive that's probably pretty, pretty fair to say. I, I know that uh, a lot of other uh, developing beer cultures in other parts of the world would, ju would just love to have the kind of homebrew community we have in this country. I mean, that's what the foundation of the craft beer and craft brewing and the microbreweries and the brew pubs, um, you know, without the home brewing community, who knows whether it would have ever developed into what we have now. I don't think so. What can we rank and file home brewers do to help spread the word, carry the, uh, the message of relax, don't worry? out to the wider public and get more people involved yeah, in this well, hobby. Teach a friend to homebrew? Do we spike the water in our municipalities with hops? <laughs> Do you have a recommendation? Well, you know, homebrewers like to hang out with other homebrewers, and homebrewers like to hang out with people who like the pleasure of beer in their life, and good beer in their life. And I think it's, you know, I think it'd be good thing to remember and not to be complacent that, um, you know, 90%, 95% of the beer that's enjoyed in this country is not made by a small brewer or home brewer, and that there's still a lot of people out there that need to be kind of turned on to good beer, better beer, call it what you want. So I think thing to do is remember that, you know, uh, don't be complacent because there's a, a still a millions and millions, 90 million beer drinkers in this country. Uh, and uh, there's still a lot of people that would really appreciate uh, being turned on to better beer. So I'd say uh, that's, that's what we can do as home brewers and beer enthusiasts is to kind uh, of share our enthusiasm with people who aren't there yet. <laughs> We've got our work cut out for us, I think. Yeah, there's still a lot to do. You'll be in business for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, I want to change tax a little bit and ask you about the, um, the first NHC. It was in Boulder, Colorado. When was that? That's the, uh, yeah, the National Homebrew Competition was in 19, February of 1979. It was the first one we ever staged. It was about, what, three months after we found it had come out with the first issue of Zymergy, which wow. was out in December of 78. I think it was February 
22nd or somewhere in February that we had uh, a gathering of about, oh, a few hundred people that came out to taste homebrews. And the, the deal was that I think we had 30 entries into the competition. One was from out of state, so we called it a national national competition. <laughs> I remember it was somebody from Minnesota or Wisconsin. I, don't, I, I believe it would, may have been somebody from Minnesota that entered. Uh, shipped their beer out, to one of the original members of the AHA. And uh, the deal was that uh, if you entered a beer, um, you had to send a case so that we could uh, share the homebrew. It's people, you know, the open to the public kind of event, mm -hmm. we, we would have some homebrew to, for people to sample. So that was, that was, a, that was the entry requirement. And in those days, people, most people were bottling in champagne bottles. Okay. or returnable soda bottles. Okay. Uh, long necks were scarce. Um, and in those days, the, th the thinking was, if I'm, gonna make, if I'm gonna put beer in a bottle and cap it, I might as well bottle at least 750 mils or a quart at a time to cut down my bottling. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? that's a lot of work. So, um, so we usually got a case of, of quarts or something you know, of, of each entry, so we had plenty. And, uh, you know, and then we had, there were two parts of the judging, the actual tasting by the judges that would go around informally and write down on their score sheets what the, what the beers tasted like and I think three or four different categories. And then also the presentation, you know, the display. There was 30 entries, 30 exhibits. So it was a presentation as well. It was a, it was a wild event. It was a fun, uh, fun event. It was, you know. Um, How was the beer? Oh, it was some of this. The beer was great. It was, I mean, people aren't going to enter their lousy beer, I can tell you that. Um, you know, stouts, porters, pale ales, um, you know, early 70s style. You know, you didn't have Imperial IPAs or right. Imperial Boxer. Stout and porters. Porter was extreme. Yeah, it was. It was. You know, people were yearning to drink the beers that they, that they had experienced in, in, in Europe, not primarily in England, because, you know, making ales was a lot more accessible. People mm -hmm. weren't. It wasn't until about 1986 when Greg Noonan published his uh, Brewing Lager Beer and Dave Miller won um, Best to Show with one of his lagers. That, that was probably you know, in 1984 or thereabouts that people kind of realized they could make lagers as well. But, you know, there's a little bit more technology involved with fermentation temperatures, mm -hmm. getting the right yeast things mm -hmm. like that, which is a really difficult task in those days, getting lager yeast. Was it mm -hmm. more of an event? Those pictures you sent me, I was just, it's so cool, like, they're in glass tulips, everyone's wearing yeah. pretty much, a, a, but were you, did you feel like you didn't know how long it was going to last, so we should hurrah, or is it just a random, did it seem Well, the pictures, uh, yeah, the pictures I sent were uh, from 1983, um, you know, we were talking about 1979. The very first yeah, one. Yeah, the very first one. Um, that was just kind of a carnival, open house atmosphere. I think by the time we get to 1982, we were in a hotel, and we were getting people from coming from all over the world. Actually, German brewmasters, and uh, you know the director of Vian Steffen and Bre Roger Brees from Mal Brees Malting and Fritz Maytag wow. from Anchor Brewing. Um, you know Fred Huber from the Huber Brewing Company. Uh, you know they were brewers. And you know, people pretty highly recognizable people in the beer industry were wanting to check check things out. And you know, it was kind of we were trying to purposely be pretty pretentious and outrageous at the time. You know, we, you know, that's when I started dressing up uh, in my tuxedo back in the mid '80s and and making these wild entrances. <laughs> and we get people dressed up in our mascot, the turkey, uh, Aylford, and have a lot of fun. And we have a you know some of the I didn't send you all the pictures, but we had a uh, you know, a big band that would play at, uh, at the dinner, you know, uh, big band music from Older the 30s. Older Swingers, I think it's said, yeah, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that. And sometimes we'd have a harpist play music during the co judging of the competition to kind of mellow out the room. And, um, you know, it was, uh, we just thought, you know, the whole pretense that beer is elegant and needed respect. You know, we just took it you know, to the extreme to, the extreme, to yeah. kind of get people to kind of refocus their attitude. And, you know, of course, people recognize that it was extreme, 
you know, harp, harp. But you know, then after a while, I said it was kind of neat. You know, you know, this, you know, this whole respect beer that you know, beer advocate is kind of grabbed onto. I think has a, you know, you know, we were home brewers always had respect for beer and mm -hmm. kind of, kind of encapsulating it with a phrase. You know, respect beer is a, a pretty, it's got a, a ring thing to that it. yeah, it has, and and you know, we were doing that back in those days, and the people that were, were, uh, you know, they were all you know. Nobody could ever agree on on the same thing. Just people can't agree on what beer is better than this. You know, you just you know everybody has their personal Some feelings. Gentle. You know, people thought that we were being a little bit too hippie-ish or too wild, and they, you know there was that faction. But you know, the organization wasn't for people who wanted to be boring and kind of same old, same old. We were just we wanted to have fun and and mm -hmm. respect mm -hmm. beer. And if you know you wanted another kind of group. It's fine to start your own group. You know, we 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 participate, but we want to have fun. <laughs> Has the social and the technical aspect of home brewing? How how have you managed to balance the social and the technical aspect of brewing in the AHA and for these conferences? Because it seems to me like the level of sophistication has increased since I started brewing. The the BA books yeah. that are available now. There's I was talking to Doug Hoverson this winter, and he said that homebrewers today have access to better information, and yeah. better analytical oh, instruments yes, than sure. brewers in the. Well, you're talking. Your the question you, you asked two different questions: the level and the balance. And the balance, I think, has always been maybe not the very first event, but you know, after that, you know, 1980, 81. I remember Chautauqua, where we first met Michael Jackson and Fred Eckhart. And, First microbrewers came to the to the event, and then and then after that, it was always I think that it's the the balance you see here in 2010 here in in Minnesota at the Home Brewers Conference is the balance of the social and the technical, and that balance has always been there. Now the level of expertise and and where we're at now is is changed. Uh, for the better and there's much more information but even then back in the 80s you know there were some pretty technical things that were being discussed when you get the the director of the uh you know Vian Steffen and the and the Dolmen's Brewing School here in Germany giving presentations I can assure you it was you know Absolutely. how malt was made and how the fermentation process and get George Fix you know the legendary George Fix up there or Michael Jackson talking about the social aspects of beer and attitude. It was all there then. It was just, we were just at a, uh, there wasn't just, there weren't as many choices of things to talk about because we had, we didn't have all this history. Right. And people aren't, you know, we, people were making their versions of extreme beers at that time. There was a garlic beer now and then, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, a yeah. barley wine that exceeded eight percent you know that those were pretty extreme exactly. things in those days and people were just as jazzed and and asked the same question would have asked the same question you just asked me here in 2010 you know did you ever think we'd be talking about these this level of technology and and socializing with so many different kinds of beer it was the same back in the early 80s as it was now but it's just a different level of it diversity and variety and come a long way yeah. baby to <laughs> sure. borrow this slogan yeah. yeah do you have time for one more question sure. charlie this sure. is the one we always end our interviews with it's open-ended what is home brewing to you hmm, i can I, I you know i i remember um when i was teaching beer making home brewing in my in my home like from 1973 to 1982 or 83, I was teaching classes uh, once a week for, you know, maybe 30 weeks out of the year. I'd have people come in and um, they'd be sitting around the living room, up to 20 people maybe, men and women who were interested in making beer. Maybe they tasted some homebrew, maybe they didn't. They just had heard about the class, that it was fun. And there were also people um, distributors that would come in, guests and just sit in, and distributors of beer, and people who sold beer, people who professionally made beer. Um, and the thing that has 
really captured uh, my interest and enthusiasm then as it continues to now to do now is when you're when you're in a group of people or with a person that you have just introduced them to some something in their lives that they are going to it's just they are so overjoyed to have discovered you know it's the wow moment and it, and it, it's not just a wow moment for that moment it's a, it's it's continues in their life it's like wow i never knew i could enjoy something this much i mean they say i didn't know i could enjoy beer as much as i do but what they're saying is i never knew i could enjoy an aspect of life as much as i do beer and 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 the enthusiasm and the excitement of them realizing that they had all this in front of them and to, and to look forward to, redis, you know, discovering mm -hmm. a beverage that they that they can enjoy, something that they could learn about, how it's made, and actually make it and then share it with their friends. It was it just it jazzes you. I mean, if you're a teacher, if you guys with Brewing TV, you know, all the people that you're reaching. You probably, oh, I'm them. yeah. Well, you're probably in it for the same reason because even if one is jazzed that you did something cool, kind of, kind of feeds you, you know. And that's what feeds me, you know. And and what reminds, what why I remember that and it's at the forefront is that I still travel um, occasionally outside of the country to dip, to developing beer cultures in different parts of the world, whether it's might be Japan or Brazil or Chile or Argentina or some other part of the world that doesn't have the beer culture we have here in this country and they want it and they know about it and then they're just they're at the stage we were in the early 80s and I, I'm just remembering that excitement and that oh yeah that's why I'm really I'm still doing what I'm still doing is because there are still so many people out there and that brings us back to the one of the original questions is you know what's there to do there's a lot to do Absolutely. It's good work. Yeah. Good work to have. I want to ask just one thing because I've always, you're so many things to so many different people, but what I like most about you is uh, you take me on journeys. Like Microbrewed Adventures is read annually at my house. Um, talk about every beer having a story or what you're missing out on if you don't leave your, your home brewery or Minnesota's five breweries. <laughs> What are you missing if you don't look way beyond what you're, you're giving yeah, up? Like, what, well, the lasting effect of a good beer is not the discussion about whether it's an IPA or an Imperial IPA or a Pale Ale or it has Cascade hops or Mount Hood hops <coughs> or it's been lagered for two months or three months. That's not the journey of beer and, and it's 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 not about necessarily about who made it or who could make it better or comparing notes or, or judging beer. Um, it's the journey you take with the beer and the people you encounter. And when you encounter people, you, you're situa you know, it's a situation. You might be at a big round table like this. I mean, the best experiences really are not, for me, is not sipping 50 different beers in a, at a festival, but every once in a while you get, you know, a real memorable, significant, memorable me moment where you're in a beer garden and you you meet a friend, new friend or an old friend, and you're there for a few hours and you start talking about your lives or what's going to happen in your life and you have a great time and something else happens. And I mean, the journey is 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 as important as the beer, you know, it's just the, the event, the, the socializing, the, the friendships and things like that. So that's what, that's the long lasting effect of beer. Who wins in a competition or the best beer festival or BU bitterness units or what hops, that's all fun. Um, but that's not really the last, that's not the lasting thing that's mm. gonna stay with you when you're still drinking beer. Hopefully when you're 70 or 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs>